board. And we are live. JT here, and welcome to The Huddle. The Huddle is where I sit down with successful people from the world of sport and coaching. It's to learn more about their journey to greatness. Why do I have these conversations? Because success always leaves clues. I want to take a moment to thank you. Whether you are watching on YouTube or on Facebook, or whether you are listening to the audio on the podcast. Thank you so much for being here with me and my special guest today. And here's my friendly reminder to you. The mind is like a parachute. It works best when it's wide open. So my challenge to you is to go all in on this conversation, to remove any distractions and get laser focused on the here and the now. And I guarantee you, you will gain a valuable nugget of wisdom that will not only help you succeed in sport, but more importantly, in the game of life. I've been looking forward to my conversation with my special guest today. Before we went live, I was mentioning to him how, you know, I, I heard him on a podcast of some mutual uh, connections a couple of years ago and kind of thought, Oh, I really want to bring him back, want to dive a little bit more into his journey. You know, I've been able to kind of watch him, you know, up close and, you know, I knew there would be some nuggets of wisdom he could share. Uh, my guest in the huddle today uh, is currently uh, serving as a member with the Edmonton Elks in the Canadian Football League. Uh, my guest in the huddle today is Scott Hutter. How are you today, brother? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely, Scott. Um, before we get kicked off, pun intended... I just want to take a moment to count my blessings. Uh, for me, counting my blessings is a daily practice. Uh, some days I do it better than others, uh, but I do find the days where I'm most consistent, most intentional counting my blessings. I do find those days are a little bit filled with a little more calm and peace. Uh, so I'm a big believer. Biggest blessing you can give anyone is your time and energy. So just want to thank you again for blessing us with some of your time and energy here today, brother. Awesome. Appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to come on and speak about uh, a couple of my favorite topics, which are playing football and coaching football and, you know, just all around the game in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the first things we uh, like to do in the huddle is to remind others that life is a game and games are supposed to be fun. You know, I had a, I had a coaching colleague that once used to often remind me that we all have these things that make us unique and different, and it's our responsibility to celebrate it. So I'm curious, what's an interesting fact about you that maybe a lot of people don't know about you that you'd be open to sharing with our community today? Oh, man, interesting fact. Um, well, I'll just tell you a little bit about my backstory. Maybe there's a couple interesting facts there. So I grew up in London, Ontario. Uh, played sports all my life, hockey, baseball, volleyball in school, basketball in school. Um, basically, I was the kid with way too much energy that uh, just mom needed out of the house and, you know, go play sports. Uh, so didn't really, uh, other than just on the playground, didn't really get involved with football until grade nine. I attended A.B. Lucas High School, high school with great football roots and tradition here in the city of London. And I was very lucky to attend Lucas because uh, the culture at that school really cared about football. And without that, maybe I was I wouldn't be as lucky and you know to have made a career uh, at this point in my life in the game of football. But you know my journey brought me to Lucas and uh, I played Rue as a person as a player there for four years. I uh, was very lucky to uh, receive a scholarship, an athletic scholarship to uh, the University of Wilfrid Laurier uh, in Waterloo, Ontario. I uh, was there, played under Michael Falds and uh, Ron Van Moorkirk, Dwayne Cameron, all, a bunch of great coaches. I was very lucky uh, to be there for four years uh, as a Golden Hawk, won a Yates Cup, uh, lost, lost another, had a lot of great memories, made a lot of really good people. Uh, and then, you know, as I moved 
into my upper years, it became apparent to me that uh, I might have an opportunity to attend a CFL combine. Um, so in 2019, I was lucky enough to receive a, an invite to uh, the CFL regional combine. At that time, they did an Eastern regional, uh, an Ontario regional and a Western regional, and then they did a national combine. These days they do uh, just one super regional combine in Waterloo, and then they do their big national combine. They move that one around. So I remember it was at uh, the U of T bubble. Uh, went, did, you know, all the classic combine tests, run, jump, do some covering drills, some special teams drills, pro agility, all that stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't get invited to the next round to the national combine, but I trained my butt off to that point. I thought I did, you know, fairly well. And I said, okay, well, the, the CFL draft for Canadians is in, uh, it's about a month after the after the combine. So, you know, I sat around for about a month, not really knowing if, uh, if uh, the next year of my life would be back at Laurier for my fifth year uh, or, you know, moving on to one of the nine uh, CFL franchises. So I was lucky enough to be drafted uh, 50th overall in the sixth round of the Canadian Football League draft by uh, the then Edmonton Eskimos. Obviously, now we've changed our name to the Edmonton Elks, but in 2019, we were the Eskimos and uh, Got a got an opportunity to play under Coach Jason Moss. Uh, my DB coach was a, a CFL Hall of Fame safety by the name of Baron Miles. Really, really good coaches. Um, can't say enough about that staff. Really gave me a chance. I ended up making the team on the practice roster. Uh, and for those of uh, you listening that don't you know, haven't had an opportunity to play uh, on a football team at the pro level. The practice roster is basically the guys you practice with the team all week, you meet with the team all week, you lift with the team all week, but you don't get to play on the game day. Um, and, you know, your your check, your check at the end of the week reflects that. <laughs> but it's a good opportunity to grow as a player and to be there as a player and to see how good you can get and if you can actually crack the game day roster and I spent about half the year on the practice roster. And uh, I remember um, the day that I, I was was supposed to play my very first game. It was a home game in Edmonton at Commonwealth Stadium against uh, the Ottawa Red Blacks. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. I've been uh, been playing special teams, defense, you know, whatever whatever the team needs. Uh, for the last four years, obviously there was a blip in there with COVID. We had a, a CFL season canceled. So technically I've been part of the, the CFL for five years now, dating back to 2019. Mm -hmm. um, but I have four seasons under my belt and I'm really excited this, this May to be going back to Edmonton uh, to attend my fifth training camp. Awesome. Um, it's interesting, right? As, as you kind of outlined your journey, what, really stood out to me was again anyone that's been around you knows like your willingness to put in the reps and sets whether it's you know in the weight room whether it's you know watching film whether it's on field like that's something that you've always done right you know I first had the opportunity to see it as an opposing coach but then you know just being at AB Lucas teaching there my final years I, I would see you come in you know in the off season when you're home and you'd come and lift and we loved it because you got to show the younger guys, this is what it takes to play at a high level. So I'm curious, has that ability to like just work like that to persist to, to that, that iron will, is that something that you've always had or was there a great teacher coach mentor that really helped you understand the value of putting in focus reps and sets every day? Well, I, you know, I've had, uh, a really good group of coaches and mentors throughout my life. Um, no matter the sport I mentioned, I played baseball, hockey, I, any, any, anything that I could get involved with, you know, ran cross country, everything. So every, every coach that I've had along the way, whether it was a club team or a school team has helped give me a piece of the puzzle, uh, and help me help shape me into the, in the man I am today. Um, mm. but I mean, foundationally it all goes back to my parents i have uh, a couple great parents both in education um and really it started there just 
you know, maybe not from an athletic standpoint, but definitely from an education standpoint, that education was really important in uh, my household growing up. And it was stressed that, you know, you have to practice, you have to do your homework, you have to study every, if you want, if you want to be really, get really good grades, then you have to study, you have to do your homework, you have to attend class and pay attention and all that stuff. And I think that's really where uh, I first understood. Maybe if I didn't understand it, it was it was drilled into me subconsciously that, you know, if you want to succeed at something, then you have to put the work in. And, you know, I uh, I've developed I think it was coming really coming out of Laurier and getting an opportunity to go to a CFL combine where I started to realize that my whole athletic focus Uh, Maybe if I didn't realize it at the time, it had been this my entire life was, you know, just to put the work in so that when the result is the result, there is no regret. Um, And I say that an example of, you know, coming up to the CFL combine, I I remember I was, uh, you know, pretty much a homebody, wasn't going out with the guys, you know, wasn't going out to party or this or that or you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't doing anything extracurricular because I wanted this goal and I wanted to train as hard as I could and treat my body as well as I could to get to that goal. And I remember telling myself, well, you know, on combine day, on draft day, if it doesn't happen for you, then you know that you've put this body of work behind you to leave no regret. Mm -hmm. You know, I think a lot of people uh, look back on, decisions on their life and you know certainly myself as well I'm not perfect but you you have a little bit of regret um and you know when I, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna sound uh like a really old man here but I love uh the Frank the Frank Sinatra line it says uh you know regrets I have a few but then again too few to mention mm-hmm. uh I forget what song that's from I think it might be uh my way by uh Frank Sinatra you know but mm-hmm. <laughs> But uh, I think that's really a great quote because, you know, everyone's going to have regret through their life. Um, But if you're willing to put the work in and, as you said, put the reps in, put the sets in, whether that's academically or career wise or athletically, then, you know, no matter what the result is, you're going to look back on your entire body of work and you're going to say, you know, I did everything I could to achieve my goal and maybe you fell just short but you're not going to have any regret because you put in that entire body of work and you're going to be proud of the process Mm. so i'm curious you know like you talked about this idea around you know at the end of the day as a human being right yeah we have some days where we absolutely kill it we have some days where you know we're like "Ah, i could have done better but the ability to put your head on your pillow at night and just know, you know what, I've, I've, I've put in the reps and sets, you know, being able to put your head down, you know, with just a certain level of calm and peace. How important has that been for you as you have navigated this life as a professional athlete? Well, it's very important, but also it's a never ending search, right? Like Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've been very fortunate to be a part of uh, the CFL for four seasons now, Unfortunately, in those four seasons, I've only been a part of a playoff team one time, Um, you know, so constantly looking towards that, that fire in your belly is going like, I, I want to compete. I want to win. And it doesn't have to be sport. It can be in in your career, your, your life uh, as well. But, you know, really successful people that you always meet they always kind of have that desire to do more no matter what is going on in their life it could be you know you know uh, there could be a lot of people in your life telling you man you're crazy you you know what do you you you've look at all of what that you've accomplished why are you so stressed about why are you still showing up to the weight room early why are you still you know why are you stressed about uh, uh this game I think I remember a certain situation in college when I was at Laurier, it was in my senior year. So I had, I was fortunate enough to start games in every single year of my college career, which doesn't happen for every athlete. So I was, I was very fortunate to be in that situation, but you get to the end of it and, you know, you've dressed, started, played in 
countless number of games, taken countless number of reps against that level of competition. And I remember telling one of my good friends that, you know, man, I, you know, I, I'm so nervous for this game coming up and he said, well, like, why, why are you nervous? Like you've, you've played this game so many times, like on the team, you probably have the most number of games played like at this point in your career. And, you know, it's a little bit of self-reflection, but it's just because you want to succeed. You know, you have that fire in your belly that you want to win. And yeah, you can be proud of yourself that you've put the work in, like I said, and you look back and you're not going to have any regrets, but there's still that competitive fire mm -hmm. that, you know, when you don't win, when you don't achieve your goal, you're going to be upset. So it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act between, you know, putting in the work to keep yourself level and make sure that at night you can put your head on the pillow, like you said, and be proud of the work that you've put in to accomplish your goals. But also it's that fire, that competitive fire that, you know, when it's go time, it's, it's, it's business and you want to win, you want to achieve your goal. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you talk about this idea of like competitive fire, right? And anyone, like you said, that's been successful, you know, in sports, in business and relationships or health and really any area of your life has that competitive fire, that, that fire in their belly. And it was interesting how um, last night we actually had a couple of your CFL uh, brothers on the call just sharing about their journey. And they said the same thing. Someone asked about how do you get rid of nerves? And they're like, what if the nerves are just a sign that you care? Like you just want more. You you realize that, hey, I, I'm deserving of great things. So I love that. Um, I, I'm curious. If you're, not, if you're not nervous, if you're not nervous, then you don't care. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the simple point. And I, I've always known that the day that I'm not nervous for mm -hmm. the opening kickoff is the day to hang it up. Because yeah. that's, you know, it, there's nothing quite like the butterflies and the roar of the crowd and the national anthem. And it's, it's just, that's, that's what you'd play for. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, like, again, you, you're, you're, you're coaching, you're guiding, you're mentoring, you know, the next generation of young people, right. In, in football right now, do you think that that's one of the things that is the value of sport is, is, is sport teaches other, you know, young people that you know when you're feeling discomfort that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing it just means you care and you're working towards something meaningful like do you do you think that being able to reframe that nerves are a good thing do you think that that's important especially with today's young people yeah i think it's i think it's just a a rec a recognition of your emotion mm -hmm. uh, i forget the exact quote but i remember hearing a, a kobe bryant clip one time that you know, fear of failure is not always a bad thing. Nerves are not always a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, the recognition of why am I feeling this way? Okay, I'm feeling this way because I care. I'm not scared of the opponent. I'm just, you know, I'm nervous for the game because I care so much about winning. And then mm -hmm. you can rechannel your energy into realizing that, you know, okay, I have put in the work. I have put in the reps and the sets to accomplish my goal with no regret. I'm nervous because I care about the outcome, but I'm confident in my ability and I'm not fearful of the opponent and I'm full speed ahead. Mm -hmm. How important has that been? So again, you know, you're touching on, you know, mindfulness, they call it this ability to reframe, right? To shift your focus or, or to, you know, we look at it as, you know, flexing your perception muscle, right? Being able to, yes, acknowledge what you're feeling, but then rechanneling it, refocusing it. How important has that skill been for you as you have, you know, walked your journey as a high quality athlete? So important. I remember reading a book um, my first year or second year at Laurier. It was called 10 Minute Toughness. And I forget what the author the author's name was, but the title was 10 minute toughness. And it was just a, uh, you know, a mental training book. And it, the main point of the book was to simply outline that, you know, you wouldn't go into an athletic competition without training your body. You wouldn't go into it without running, without jumping, without lifting weights, 
stretching, you, you wouldn't do that. So why would you go into a mental or why would you go into an athletic competition without training your mental capacity to endure stressful environments, to endure stressful emotions that may arise from within you? And it was all about how constantly you should be visualizing your success, visualizing challenges that come to you and how you're going to overcome them. And, but in doing that, just creating confidence within yourself that by the time you play the game, I've already gone through these emotions a hundred times. I've seen this picture that I'm currently seeing in live action when I was laying my head down on the pillow last night, visualizing the success for the game. I've, I've lived the game before the game's even played. And when you go about it that way, you think about your mental capacity that way, it just opens a whole new level of ability for you to endure, you know, stressful situations where lots of people are watching and, you know, the crowd's yelling at you and the game's on the line and everything is, is so stressful and tight and, but you're very calm mm -hmm. because you've lived it and you've lived through these emotions before. Mm. It's interesting as you share, you know, and I, I think back to, you know, an idea that many people have been conditioned and trained that I have to see it to believe it. But what you were sharing there was again, the power of the mind, right? Like you have to see, you have to create that mental image in your mind of you, you know, being successful, right? Of you putting in and, and executing that that play to the best of your ability that by tapping into the power of your mind, by creating that mental image that you actually set yourself up to act, to to manifest it in the physical world. Absolutely. And a lot of, and especially in football, but other sports as well, players already do that without really thinking about it just by watching film. Right. The reason you watch film is to recognize, especially as a safety on defense, oh, that formation, they have a tendency to run this, that motion means this and, you know, so on and so forth. So you practice that all week by watching the film. And then by the time you get to the game, you're able to recognize what's actually going on. Yeah. Now, I'm curious, is that part of your mental process now? Like the ability, like obviously you put in the physical reps, right? Training in the weight room, you know, on field. How important, how's your game evolved in terms of the mental side of the training? No, oh, it's so important. Like you have to, there's, there's different ways to go about it, but you definitely have to train your emotions, train your mind. And it even starts, like I said, when you're watching film, to put yourself in that scenario. Okay, this situation is going on this much time on the clock, we're down, or we're up, whatever the situation is, how am I going to be feeling in that moment, as I'm watching this play right here unfold? Okay, how am I, am I going to be nervous to make the play? Am I going to, you know, what happens if something bad happens, I give up, you know, like I said, I'm a safety, I'm a DB, sometimes you give up uh, pass plays. What happens if someone catches a ball on me? Well, you know what, how am I going to respond? And that's how you go through your mental training as you're going through film work and that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And it even translates to the practice field. You know, practice is a great opportunity to elevate your level of compete by sounds silly, but pretending it's the game. Like th this is, it's not just practice. This is very important. This is, and, and not in terms of physically trying to run through someone and tackle them and injure your teammates, but in terms of, I'm not going to give up a play today. I'm going to make sure that my communication is a one today with my teammates, because it's very, it's vital that we get communicated and lined up and run the correct play today. Mm -hmm. It's vital that the stress of, you know, the crowd that's not there, but the crowd of coaches and players and whatnot, see me make my play and succeed. Mm -hmm. Because by the time you train all week between the practice field and the film room, 
by the time you get to the game, you've gone through those emotions before. You've seen the the looks. You've seen how you're going to respond in different situations. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, you know, as you share there, you know, sort of this idea of making practice harder than the games, right? And that's often a, a cliche that's, that's talked about in sport. Now you've had the opportunity to be part of some special teams, right? I think back to um, obviously, you know, knowing, you know, um, your, your group of friends, you know, in high school, you were surrounded with, you know, a lot of high quality individual, but a lot of high quality student athletes, right? So I can imagine practice was probably a lot more challenging than games you went into, you know, at Laurier, you were, you were, you know, you were part of a, a great, you know, I think back to that 2016, right. When you guys sort of won that Yates cup, it was, you know, a pretty special group. So I guess my question is how important has that been important to be around other strong and powerful leaders, people who are going to push you to be at your best, you know, in practice so that when you can really turn it on in games. Oh, it's so vitally important. And, you know, it's, it's not always going to be a good feeling. It's not always going to be all buddy, buddy, and very, you know, uplifting as some people that have never had the benefit of playing team sports might think it is, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes the competitive nature is going to be two teammates getting into a fight, not maybe physically, but verbally, you know, emotionally. Um, it's going to be two at this point in my career, it's going to be two grown men competing for a job. Mm -hmm. It's going to be two players who both want the same goal as far as team success, mm -hmm. but they want to prove that they're better than their teammate lining up across from them, you know, mm -hmm. and that can sound very, uh, you know, toxic and that can sound very uh, stressful, but pressure makes diamonds. And mm -hmm. some of the best teammates that I've ever had and some of the best leaders that I've ever had balance that line very well between mm -hmm. being able to be your friend and uplift you as a teammate, but also be a competitor and get in your face and push you harder when it's needed. I'm curious your perspective. I love that idea. Like you said, like pressure creates diamonds. And, and I think back to, you know, one of your uh, great high school coaches, Coach Samways. And one of the things I loved about him was um, our last year of teaching, because we both left teaching the same year. We had this like competitive game where it was like, who can watch more film? So it'd be like, you would see, we could see those tallies on huddle and and see it there. So I guess my my question is, is that important to, to, to really find that person that, that brings up, like, how has that benefited you in your life? Like that ability to just have someone challenge you in a loving way. And just, just so you know that they're doing it to push you to be great. Oh, it's, it's vitally important. If you don't have those people around you, then, you know, you're going to get complacent and it's very easy to get complacent. It's very easy for, you know, me to sit here and say, Oh, I, you know, I've played four years in the CFL and I want, you know, I've done this and this, I've had this success, that success, but there are still people out there, teammates of mine and other people that are, you know, around the league in the NFL, whatever that have success that you look at and it's not jealousy, but it's competitive. It's that competitive edge that I want that, you know, I want that success. I see, former teammates of mine win the great cup. And I say, I want that, you know, I'm happy mm -hmm. for them, but I want that. Mm -hmm. I want to do everything in my power because I want all the eyes on me and my teammates lifting that trophy at the end of the year. I'm happy mm -hmm. for my friend and my former teammate, but I want to beat him. Mm -hmm. I want to destroy him on the field. Mm -hmm. I want people to recognize that the work that my teammates and I have put it in is extraordinary because even when you go through a losing season, the amount of work that you put in is not, you know, nothing. You put in such a great amount of work to play this game from a mental aspect, from a physical aspect, an emotional aspect. And sometimes that's why losing is so devastating because 
you have a group of men, coaches, players, uh, trainers, everyone, I should say men and women. Um, but you have that group together that is working so hard to accomplish the goal. And when you do accomplish that goal, it's adulation. It's amazing. It's the best feeling in the world. But when you don't accomplish that goal, it can be gut wrenching. It can be heartbreaking. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of sport is that it is a competitive game and not everyone's going to succeed. Mm. So I'm curious, like you were mentioning that idea of, you know, when you see other people creating success, do you think there comes a point in life where you start to realize, like, I want that and that person's just showing me what's possible for me or us? Like, do you think that there's a switch that sort of flips at some point where you start to realize, yeah, they're just, they're just showing you what's possible? Yeah. And I think, you know what, I think it was uh, a little bit later. I was late to the train on uh, recognizing this is how I wanted to uh, live my life and think about the world. Um, you know, just because I classic Canadian humble upbringing, I, you know, I was just happy with life. I was happy with this, happy with that. But then you start to realize that there are people out there that are accomplishing so much in the fields that you're interested in, in terms of me, it's football, all the great coaches, and all the great players that are accomplishing so much. And it took a while for me to understand that it wasn't a bad thing for me to want that. It would be a bad thing for me to want that and point and say, they don't deserve that. I, I deserve that and not put in the work to do that. Mm -hmm. But it's not a bad thing to recognize, oh, I want that. And then go back and Put in the work, put in the reps and the sets and train yourself to get to that point and be competitive to say, I want that and I'm going after that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. So I'm curious, like from your perspective, I love that idea, like that sort of Canadian humbleness, right? Like, you know, sort of polite. Do you think that that is something like if I look at my kids? You know, they're very, they know what they want, right? When I think back, like kids, like when they're babies, they know they want to go for a nap. They know they want food. They know when they want to be burped. Like, do you think it's that idea where we, it's sort of conditioned and trained out of us to, you know, be more humble, you know, stop wanting, stop wanting more. Like, I don't know. I'm kind of curious your perspective on that. I think it's a little bit of, mm possibly an inferiority complex because okay. we, you know especially living up here in Canada we we go through the point where a lot of our media that we consume a lot of the sports that we watch is the the giant down south in the states that mm -hmm. you know, is constantly telling us that they're the best and they produce the best and they are the best mm -hmm. and you know you go through your life and if no one tells you that you can also accomplish those things, then mm -hmm. you maybe start to believe it. Yeah. So, you know, at least for me, it was, it was just the recognition that, especially when I got to the CFL and I, mm -hmm. you know, I'm in training camp with guys that have played in the NFL and that are high draft picks, first round NFL draft picks come into the CFL to look for another opportunity because it didn't work out for them in the NFL or they're at the end of their career and they want to keep playing. So they come up to the NFL or, you know, a guy that got looked over because he was, he wasn't quote unquote good enough in college and comes up to the, the CFL. And it wasn't until I got there that I started to realize, Oh, these, these players are, very polished especially the ones that come from big d1 programs are very mm -hmm. polished but they're not better mm -hmm. they're you know there's some guys don't get me wrong that are killers on the field they're uh, uh, absolutely unbelievable mm -hmm. but i've seen canadian athletes do the same thing mm -hmm. you know and it's not it's not as far as a talent drop off as some people might imagine. And once you get that confidence that, Oh, I belong here. And mm. you know, that guy played at Alabama, but I belong here. And that guy played at Auburn. That guy played at Michigan, 
but you know, we all play now in the same league. It's, you know, it's a great feeling, but it also opens your eyes to, I should have been pushing myself way earlier in my life because <laughs> just because I didn't have, I wasn't, a, uh, didn't have the opportunity to go to the big D one program. I didn't have the opportunity, you know, to get all the, the fancy glitz and glamor and whatever didn't mean that I wasn't a talented athlete. Mm -hmm. It just meant that I had to push myself a little bit harder to work, to polish myself, to get to the same point. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's that, like that idea of like, sometimes you, you just simply need to ask yourself, like, why not me? Right. And, and there's power in that when you start to understand that, no, I, I do belong here. I'm, I'm deserving of great things. These people put their pants on one foot at a time, one leg at a time, just like I do. And it's interesting when that you sort of have that perspective. It's interesting how things just start to slow down, right? You start to feel a little more calm and confident like you talked about. Yeah, absolutely. And that's part of the mental training that you go through is mm -hmm. the recognition that I have put in the work. Mm -hmm. I do belong here. And I'm going to go out and execute to the highest of my ability to prove mm. that I belong here. Mm. Mm. It's interesting. Um, one of the things, and, and, you know, we had the opportunity to reconnect at, at a CFL PA event uh, in conjunction with the great cup festival in November. And one of the things that it really seemed like was it seems like the leaders in the CFLPA start like, like the, it's really a down to earth group, right? Like there's a very sort of like that humbleness, like they really enjoy being around fans, provide a great experience. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious, has that been sort of your experience as, you know, during your time in, in the CFL and just seeing this sort of brotherhood, but just wanting to connect with fans and really show them the human side of this, of the game? Well, that's, yeah, that's one of the things that I really love about the CFL is uh, the ability to connect with fans. And, you know, it's no secret, you know, it's we're very fortunate to get paid to live our dreams and play professional football. Mm -hmm. And what I think is, you know, paid very well, but it's not the ginormous salaries that people see in the NFL, in the NHL, in Major League Baseball in the NBA, right? The sort of superstardom of multi, multi millionaires. And here's the, the small CFL where guys are making a pretty good living in what I think, but they're not making that sort of living. They're not making generational wealth changing livings. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think that is part of why CFL athletes connect with fans so well mm -hmm. is because we're not living different lives. You know, we, we get to play football and we're very lucky. We get to play a child's game to earn our living, but you know, we're, we're driving the same cars that the fans are. We're, yeah. <laughs> we're living in the same apartments in the same houses that the fans are, yeah. you know, our lifestyles aren't that different. Whereas, you know, in some of the other leagues and, you know, it's not that money changes you, but money definitely changes your lifestyle when you have multi, multi millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that, like, going back to what we were talking about earlier, I think every athlete should aspire to get to the highest level achievable for them. And I think it's not a bad thing to look at someone and say, I'm going to put the work in because I want that. I want that sort of lifestyle or I want that notoriety. I don't think that's a bad thing, mm -hmm. but I think that's just one of the hidden gems that is the CFL that, you know, it's very easy for the athletes in the CFL to connect with fans because we're, you know, we're, we're, we're all in it together <laughs> and we yeah. all love football and we're all there because it's a league of opportunity. And it's, you know, so many people have different roads to get there. I've had teammates that played in the 
Canadian Junior League to get to the CFL, played in U Sports to get to the CFL, played NCAA to get to the CFL, played in the NFL and then came to the CFL, played over in Europe and came over to the CFL. And there's every sort of story. Just like in life, you meet any of these fans, there's every sort of story you could ever imagine of how they got into football. So mm -hmm. I think that connection is really important to the league. And I think that's one of the great things about the CFL. Mm. It's interesting as you share that, uh, two things sort of popped up. That idea of, you know, that diversity is our strength. I know the CFL, you know, has programs and does talk about diversity as our strength. But it was interesting, even that event that we reconnected at, you know, how many other professional leagues would have an event during their quota during their championship where leaders in that space are at an event where they are rubbing shoulders with, you know, fans and having conversation and, you know, kind of like similar to what we caught up. I like you said it, that is the beauty of the CFL and just hope more people start to see the beauty that's within our game. Oh, it's fantastic. I mean, I remember, uh, 2021, we were on a long road trip and uh, we stayed the night in Regina after a game against the Rough Riders. And, uh, you know, a couple of the teammates and I went to a local pub uh, and we had some dinner and some drinks. And, you know, there's uh, fans from the game wearing Edmonton gear sitting beside us. So we strike up conversations and we're talking with them all night. And, you know, the night ends and no one thinks anything of it. Flash forward to this past year, so 2023, two whole years later. And after one of our games at home, uh, they allow fans to come on the field uh, and players come out of the locker room and sign stuff for the kids and meet and greet and all that stuff. And, you know, a gentleman walks up to me and says, hey, Scott, like, uh, do you remember me? And I had to apologize. I didn't recognize him off the bat, but he said, uh, you know, Victoria Tavern. And I said, I remember you. I remember our night together in Regina with that group of people. And we started talking about life and whatnot. And it's, you know, little connections like that, that, uh, that you have in this league that are just, they're, they're special. And it makes people want to come out and cheer for their local athletes and their, you know, their favorite CFL teams. Mm. So I'm curious from your perspective, as someone who really has, you know, you played public Ontario high school football, right? You went to U sport. Uh, now you're at the CFL, right? You're, you're playing at the highest level uh, in this country. What do you think needs to happen to really help others to see? Like, I mean, obviously, you know, people in our space see the inherent beauty of the CFL, but what, what do you think needs to happen for us to really take this game to the next level so that more people can start to understand just, just the beautiful lessons within it and just how, what a great connector and how it can really build a sense of greater community? I think just eyeballs on the game and the ability to experience the game. Uh, I know the CFL in the past couple of years has done uh, a great job with their touchdown Atlantic game. And that has to do with trying to expand Atlantic Canada, but now they're moving it to uh, this year. They're doing a touchdown Pacific game in Victoria. And, you know, the Argos have been doing training camp in Guelph for years. And I think it, it and they do a preseason game at the university of Guelph. And I think it just, it, it's more eyeballs in terms of, moving different preseason games around, moving games around, having different events in, in big city centers, small city centers, getting eyes on your product, making sure that you connect with people so that they have a personal experience with someone associated with the CFL. Just like I said, you know, I had a, had a, a meal and a couple of drinks with one of our fans in Regina and, uh, a couple of years later, he's at a game again watching because, you know, he, he loves the team, but maybe he wants to come out and, and see me after the game or something like, you know. So the more eyeballs you have and more experiences that you give people around this country to interact with the athletes and the teams, I think that those relationships start to sell themselves. Mm -hmm. Just like we were talking about 
why the CFL is special and those connections and those relationships, the more of those that you allow to happen organically, the more people are going to care about the league. Mm. And I think to all the amazing connections that you're making as a current CFL player and, you know, doing the work you're doing right now with the London junior Mustangs and just how that is showing, right? Like what's possible, like your shining example to these young people about what's possible, where this beautiful game can take you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it really is a wonderful, amazing game. And I always tell when I get an opportunity to, uh, to speak at, you know, um, high school banquets and stuff like that. I've been lucky enough to, to go back to AB Lucas and do a couple of those banquets in the last couple of years. And eventually a player's football journey ends, yeah. right? Whether it's before high school, after high school, university, at the pro level, eventually as a football player, it's going to end. It's the nature of the game. You don't wake up when you're 50 years old and go with your buddies to play some pickup football like mm -hmm. you do in some of the other sports. It doesn't happen. Some days you hang up the helmet and the cleats and you never put them back on. However, that doesn't mean that your relationship with the community and the game has to end, right? Mm -hmm. Like everyone looks the natural uh, succession between – playing and then going to coach everyone that's just drilled into our heads. Oh, after I'm done playing, maybe I'll go coach, but that's not the only Avenue to stay in the game. There are so many people that make this game great. There are athletic trainers and massage therapists and chiropractors and uh, you know, social media people and photographers and general managers and uh, marketing executives and uh, at the university level, athletic directors and, um, you know, equipment people and, you know, broadcasters and the list goes on and on. And there's so many different avenues that I've been lucky to see former teammates of mine explore. And it just opens your mind to what's possible, right? Past just, well, I'm going to play and then I'm going to be done and I'm never going to interact with the football community again, or I'm going to play and then I'm going to try and be a coach, but you know, there's only so many coaching jobs. So, uh, you know, it might not work out and then I'm going to be done with the football community. You know, football is a great sport in terms of even just like, look at just the tailgate, the aspect and the culture around tailgating. It's bringing the community together to have a meal, have some beverages, go enjoy a sporting event and bring the community to, community together. So mm -hmm. my advice to anyone that may be listening or even, you know, to you, stay involved, right? Mm -hmm. the, the community is so great and there's so many avenues to stay involved that there's, there's really no excuse not to. Mm-hmm. I love that. And uh, so simple. And, you know, the more people we keep, like you said, stay involved in the game, the more richer experience we can create for those that are coming in behind us. Right. I should mention, I've, I've named all those different careers. Refereeing is another one. Refereeing is a great career choice <laughs> that some people don't like they never think about, right? Yeah. But whether it's at the minor level, the high school level, the university level or the pro level, it's something that can keep you attached to the game that the game desperately needs, especially mm -hmm. right now. I think I think kind of our our angry mob sports fan culture has kind of driven a lot of people away from refereeing and officiating sports. Mm -hmm. um, but without officials, we don't we don't play. Right. So that's a very vital aspect of the game that is, you know, a lot of people can stay involved. Mm. Great reminder. And I know our officials are going to love hearing that message, especially from a current player and just understanding, again, there's lots of ways to stay involved in this beautiful game. Um, so Scott, I, again, I want to be respectful of your time and energy. Um, yeah. Is there, is there anything that, uh, we can help and support you with is there anything you know uh you know are you active on social is there anything where you know people can sort of follow and sort of bring some attention and help sort of share you know kind of what you're up to 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Uh, you know, if anyone ever needs anything or has any questions about my journey or, you know, getting to the point that I've gotten or different things to that I've experienced in my life. And, you know, I'm very, very much an open book. Don't be afraid to reach out, ask any questions, but also just uh, turn on the TV this summer, turn on a TV and uh, sit down and watch some Edmonton Alex games. Absolutely, brother. And, and uh, we'll be watching away and I always love watching you do your thing. And uh, it's, it's been amazing uh, to see kind of this growth and evolution you know, over the last 10 plus years. Um, so Scott, I, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you. I, I want to acknowledge you for the great man you are, the great son, the great coach, um, the great mentor, but more importantly, the amazing human being you are, Scott. Uh, the one thing I've always appreciated about you is just how your just commitment to doing the work. Like you, like you are someone who, you know, when we first met, you didn't say much, but you lead by example. You lead through actions. And and I just want to thank you for reminding me, reminding others that really a willingness to do the work is how you reach your next level of greatness. So thank you for that. Well, thank you again for uh, all your kind words and the ability to come on your podcast and uh, kind of tell my story. And uh, I just really appreciate that opportunity. Absolutely, Scott. So folks, Scott dropped so many valuable nuggets of wisdom that will not only help you succeed in sport, but more importantly, in the game of life. But as I like to remind you every week in the huddle, knowledge is potential power. It's the consistent and focused application of great knowledge that actually creates greater results in your life. So my challenge to you is to take one of these valuable nuggets of wisdom and go apply it to your life today. And as I like to remind you every week in the huddle, you are deserving of greatness. You are worthy of greatness. You are greatness. And my only ask from these conversations, if it resonated with you, if it touched your heart, then please share it with a friend, a loved one, a teammate, just someone you feel would benefit from listening to these positive, inspiring, and empowering ideas. The more people we have listening, understanding, and applying these simple principles to their life, the more blessed this world will be. As always, love having these conversations with you in the huddle. Have a blessed rest of your day, everyone.